It's Sunday, March 7th, and this is For Good Reason. Welcome to For Good Reason. I'm DJ Grothy. For Good Reason is the radio show and the podcast produced in association with the James Randi Educational Foundation, an international nonprofit whose mission is to advance critical thinking, mostly about the paranormal, pseudoscience, and the supernatural. My guest this week, I'm very pleased uh, to have Lionel Tiger. He's the best selling author of Men in Groups, The Imperial Animal, The Pursuit of Pleasure. Optimism, the Biology of Hope, and the Decline of Males. His articles have appeared in the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, Rolling Stone, Harvard Business Review, and Brain and Behavioral Science. He's the Charles Darwin Professor of Anthropology at Rutgers University. He joins me on For Good Reason to talk about his new book, co-authored with Michael McGuire, God's Brain. Welcome to For Good Reason, Professor Lionel Tiger. I'm happy to be here. Professor, uh, God's Brain, this book is getting quite some attention among critics and in the media. Let's start off with what you mean by God's Brain. Obviously, you're not talking about there being an actual God and seeing evidence of his brain in the universe. Basically, the idea is that the brain is God's instrument. And to the extent that there is a representation of God or godliness or piety among human beings, our argument was the most sensible and likely and interesting location for that kind of deity would be the brain. The customary thing has been to talk about the soul or mm. something equivalent to that, which seems to me an unfortunate evasion of the responsibility to look things in the face. And with the brain, we have an immense amount of new data which fall into place as a way of explaining why people uh, are attracted to religious experience, what it means to them conceptually, intellectually, and personally, as well as sexually and morally in every which way. And we thought that it was scientifically responsible and, in a human sense, respectful to look at if you will, where religion takes place. It may take place in churches, it may take place at revival meetings, it may take place in gospel halls, but it always takes place in brains. Mm. Religion is especially what the brain does, in other words. Well, our, our, do you remember uh, when you were a kid there was a toy uh, that involved a little duck sitting on the lip of a glass and it would dip its beak into the glass and get some water. Right, the barometric pressure thing, yeah. Right. Well, that, I think, is how the brain operates. The brain created religion, and religion feeds the brain, and it's a never-ending loop, Mm. except for people that step out, like atheists and uh, others. But uh, that's rather a separate issue from the uh, large issue that, uh, of course, we're... Uh, talking about now, Mm -hmm. which is how do we explain this utterly remarkable behavior? You talked about the small number of people, rather unique people, who step out of it and kind of look at it from the outside. And you appear to me to be one of those folks. You're studying religion from a scientific perspective, not from a perspective of faith. This isn't a book that will bring you closer to God necessarily. Do you think that closes certain experiences off from you? In, In other words, you're one of those people on the outside looking in, aren't you? No. I was lucky enough to be in the Caribbean a couple of weeks ago, and and my hosts dragged me to an Anglican service in an old Swedish church which had been built there in 1866 or something like that. I'm not normally somebody that hangs around religious services, but this was delightful Mm -hmm. because it had been Caribbeanized. And all the hymns had a lilt and a beat, and people were genuinely enjoying themselves for the act of, first of all, being there, 
but also because they were doing something rather lovely. And uh, at the end of it, everyone was told to hug the person next to them and all that usual stuff, which they did, and uh, we we did. And I, I have to say that apart from the incomprehensible material in the sermon, <laughs> uh, the rest of it was uh, a very pleasant way to spend the Sunday morning. Well, I get what you're saying. I've gone to Easter service uh, at St. Paul's Cathedral. Uh, I've been to St. Peter's Basilica in Rome. You know, I'm into religion in that way. I love going to church, but as an atheist, I'm still on the outside. In other words, I'm not experiencing it firsthand, and I take it from what you just said. You're not experiencing it firsthand. You're um, looking at it as a scientist, as a skeptic, but on the other hand, you're not like most scientists or skeptics who turn to religion, say the new atheists, you know, uh, in that you don't think buying into religion is necessarily a bad thing, that it makes you an idiot. You just talked about, you know, going to church in the Caribbean. Um, for you, religion is a perfectly natural human thing, and you're just aiming to explain it with science, right? I'm a natural scientist. And if you have to agree that 90% at least of human societies, human people, experience or display some sort of thing we would call religion, you would have to be either antisocial or statistically challenged <laughs> to claim that religion was abnormal. Mm. And I'm afraid that, for example, Richard Dawkins, admire him though I do, and we're buddies, we've been on panels together often enough, and he's a wonderful writer. I think that he uh, shouldn't end up somehow implying that 90% of our species is subnormal, that violates all known rules of biology. Mm. Well, they're not abnormal in that it's natural. You look at the bell curve, most people are religious. Um, but his point, and I think you're conceding it when you, when you talk about the mumbo-jumbo in a sermon, you don't buy that. Um, so they, they might be naturally religious, but still they're wrong on the facts. This happened to be a particularly bumbly sermon. I, I, I'm not a connoisseur of sermons, <laughs> and I, I'm not sure I accept the fact that somebody who's uh, been ordained necessarily has the right to tell me the truth without exposure to the evidence. But nonetheless, uh, I, I have to be humble here, simply because as a, somebody interested in human biology, I just think a religion is, in fact, amazing. Mm. When you think of you, the buildings you mentioned earlier in, in your autobiography of great masses I've heard, <laughs> uh, then you you realize that people built those places. They're mm -hmm. still building them. The two largest cathedrals in the world are being built as we speak in the United States of America, in Washington and New York City. Mm. Now, why? These are expensive. These are difficult. Uh, they, they require endless fundraising. And you have to somehow stand back and say, well, perhaps there's um, a, a point here that has to do with the maintenance of social structure, the maintenance of a sense of community, and that the particular set of ideas is neither here nor there. Mm. It's rather like, uh, forgive me for seeming uh, impious here, but it's like going to a musical comedy and you love the music and the action, the plot, well, that's something else. <laughs> so, uh, again, spoken like a religious skeptic, but you're talking about the utility of religion, that it serves real human needs, and in fact, that's uh, one of the points of your book. Um, uh, so let's just get into it. Let's talk about one of your arguments, that one big thing people get out of religion is a feeling of oneness with all of humanity. I'm, I'm not saying all religion, you know, religion when it's good, not when it's destructive. And that fellow feeling, that feeling of oneness, you and I would probably agree that it's not mystical, it's instead neurological. If you're explaining religion with science, with neurology, say, and I'm not suggesting you're explaining it away, um, then this feeling of oneness coming from religion actually, you suggest, comes down to a neurotransmitter, serotonin. Tell me what you mean by your argument that religious communities are actually serotonin factories. At this service, my famous attendance recently, <laughs> the, uh, the, the people were singing hymns, they were reciting various prayers, which again... Uh, are not efforts to prove a point scientifically or engineering theorems. They were they were folk tales about this and that. 
And the music went on, and there was the officiating uh, person who had beautiful clothes on. It was uh, sort of exceptional in the sunny tropics to have a guy wearing this very elaborate costume. And uh, he was poised in the center of the room. At the end, uh, the room was uh, quite attractive in a spare Scandinavian way because it had been built by Swedes. And uh, then as people went for communion, which is uh, interesting and rather visceral in itself, and then they left and he was at the door smiling, saying hello to everybody, shaking their hand, giving them a hug. And you can be certain that if you were to do a blood assay of what was going on in those parishioners' uh, bloodstreams, you'd find a very decent level of serotonin, oxytocin, all of the juices that accompany affiliation. Mm. So if brain juice sloshing around in our noggin helps explain how sociable we are, how well we get on with other people, you're saying religion uh, increases those happy brain juices, right? Uh, serotonin, you mentioned the, the cuddle drug, oxytocin. Um, can't we get those not only just by popping a pill, but having other social institutions that work just as effectively? The question is, why haven't there been such institutions that operate as effectively? When we look at the history of the development of moral systems, which I, we talk about a little bit in the book, mm -hmm. basically they all came uh, during the period of crisis when we moved from hunting and gathering, where we lived in small communities of two, 300 people, and everyone knew that they depended on each other and there was no question about community. Community was life itself. Then we moved to agriculture and pastoralism, and we started going to a different scale with uh, hundreds, thousands, tens of thousands of people. And that's when you begin getting images like the Lord is my shepherd, which otherwise is very peculiar, uh, because it involved that shift to a different scale. Mm -hmm. And I think that the people that handled that knew something that, for example, the communists didn't. They seem to have had a better theory of human nature than the communists or, if you will, the closest precursors to uh, the kind of social experience you're talking about, the utilitarians, mm -hmm. they're not elegant. They don't have good music. They don't have good costumes. They don't have good buildings, really. Uh, somehow there's a difference in the attention paid to warm elegance as a feature of Sunday morning. Hmm. And uh, again, I'm not saying this in criticism of, of very serious efforts to create new forms of society, new forms of human community, and new theories of equity and all that. All very important. Definitely. In fact, it explains uh, for you so much of why religion makes sense to people. It's not just the supernatural stuff, but, you know, uh, religion helps people come to grips with social inequity, uh, gives them reason to be in community, and e even if everything's not fair in the world. If you look at the history of American music, it basically comes from the gospel music. And the gospel music provided a, a way for people who were really in a fix, who had been given a very poor shake in life, a place where they could shake and they could feel important and they could feel somebody. Mm -hmm. And if it took Jesus or somebody to give them this citizenship, so be it. They also got some good music out of it. Mm. And so one of, the, uh, one of the features of religious communities is that everyone is equal as mm -hmm. a Catholic, as mm -hmm. a Jew, as a whatever. Now, we know that that's not quite how it works and that the local church has its own hierarchy and et cetera, et cetera. But the theory is that everyone is equal under God. And the fact that the religious impulse has a superior officer, if you will, virtually all the time, Allah, God, whatever, uh, suggests that the removal, temporarily, presumably at least, of the implacability of hierarchy is very appealing to people. Mm. Well, that actually gets back to the previous topic, though, when we were talking about replacements for religion and, uh, you know, can humanism or rationalism muster enough to replace outmoded systems about uh, hierarchy or the meaning of life or what's right and wrong. Uh, you're talking about religion making sense for people, social inequality, because it gives them possibly the illusion of 
the priesthood of believers or whatever, that we're all equal under God. Can't secular social justice movements help people work against social inequality as well? Or would you consider all social movements of conviction to just be aping religion of sorts? I, I wouldn't want to put it that way. But on the other hand, who's stopping people from having as much fun in a meeting of the Democratic Party in Minnesota <laughs> uh, as at a high mass? You know, uh, it, it, it's available to everybody. Mm. And the fact is that. Somehow, the political parties, apart from the the Wobblies and the early lefty union groups, which I remember singing the songs of when I was a kid, they didn't pay so much attention to the uh, active community. Mm. Yes, you did have a kind of supranationalism, nationalism, as in this land is your land, and you know everyone feels very teary and so on. But then that's divided into parties and contests and so on. Very different from the sense of community, which undoubtedly people have, of affiliating to a religion by their own behavior. Mm. For example, on the corner of my street, there's a, a, I guess the man's Pakistani, a a fruit and vegetable vendor, and uh, five times a day, he puts his forehead on the concrete and he prays. Mm. Now, this is a behavior so aberrant under other circumstances, he, he'd be regarded as nuts. But it's acceptable because he's taking part in a system that people understand, may not be understandable, but it has a kind of historic legitimacy. Mm. One development in the uh, skeptics movement or the rationalist movement, also humanism, is the growth of these non-religious communities out there. There's a whole kind of burgeoning, they call it skeptics in the pub, right? Skeptics in the pub groups where people get together once a month or once a week to socialize over their libations, you know, at at some pub. I guess it doesn't have to be a pub. It could be skeptics in the coffee house. But here are communities growing up where people know each other's, not only their names, but their kids' names. They celebrate the passages of life, you know, birthday parties for each other. I mean, it's, it does seem kind of a paltry replacement uh, for movable feasts or something, the high holy calendar or something like that. But uh, it seems to me the first thing is the inner drive to connect in community and religion builds on that. Are you suggesting otherwise that religion feeds that, in fact? It's more efficient. What you describe is and obviously can be very heartwarming to the people who take part. It's what a lot of suburban life in North America is like, mm-hmm. uh, the tailgate parties. Right, bowling leagues or, or you know, poker nights, not, not church exactly. singing groups. Yeah. Yeah. However, communities also have a, not a, merely a desire, but they have a kind of need to be efficient. And uh, if you can pass off this issue of community to some people who are specialists in it, Mm. then that's very interesting. I think it's important to bear in mind that uh, whatever one thinks about God and theology and so on, uh, religious people did shape up at Katrina Mm -hmm. faster than the governments, way faster than the uh, government that we had at the time, and more uh, valiantly, more heartily, uh, more self-sacrificingly. And that's uh, a fairly common pattern. People in the United States uh, still give more money to religions than to anything else. Mm -hmm. Now, you have to ask why they're doing it. Is it because they think they're part of a circle of generosity which they have experienced in their own religious or, if not religious, at least social experience connected with religion? Mm. It is true. The numbers show that religious people are more charitable, they give more to charity, and not just to religion than secular folks. But on the other hand, and I, I just feel obligated to say that after the, you know, the acts of God the, with not only Katrina, but the tsunami a few years ago in East Asia, the secular community raised hundreds of thousands of dollars. And even Richard Dawkins Foundation recently for Haiti, uh, I think it was non-believers giving aid, the James Randi Educational Foundation took part in that and raised $350,000 in a matter of, uh, I think it was just days, from people who were self-described as non-religious. So I get your point, but I just want to mention... Uh, no, I think you're, I, I appreciate what you say, and, uh, and it's to be heartily 
if I may use the word blessed. Uh, <laughs> but the fact is that human beings are generous creatures. We're committed to societies. Uh, we all understand the uh, the tragedy of the kids and those terrible ads with the cleft lip and mm. so on. It, that's just easy. And you don't have to be religious or an atheist to respond warmly and generously if you're so inclined to that image. However, all I'm suggesting is that given the clumsiness of human arrangements very often and the fear people have about whether their uh, arrangements will sustain themselves, it's interesting, and that's all I'm claiming for it, it's interesting that religious organizations have been so skillful at managing this for so long, often against great opposition, Mm. and again, usually at some cost. If you look at the cost of tax exemptions and church buildings and all of that stuff, it's very very expensive business, more expensive uh, even than sports, I would think. Mm. I want to talk about some of the other claims you make in the book, a uh, really thought-provoking book to me. Many scholars of religion see religion as kind of initial or basic science, you know, as a way to explain the mysteries of the universe. You go up to the big mountain, you have this numinous feeling and and, you know, there's thunder, and so what is it? It's a- angry gods to explain that as opposed to thunder. Um, so kind of a rudimentary science. That's one explanation of religion. For you, it's also about deep-seated social, psychological needs that we, that all of us as homo sapiens especially have uh, to reduce stress and stress especially about death. So religion and death for you are really intertwined. Can you provide me, I'll give you 30 cents if you can, a better marketing device than the idea of the afterlife? (laughs) Right. Uh, You go door to door, you say, join us, and you don't have to be dead when you're dead. An atheist goes door to door, my gosh, that's no sales pitch. Join us, and by the way, when you're dead, you're dead, and you know, we have nothing to give you. So no wonder one catches on. That's what you're saying. Well, because uh, humans are maybe not all smart, but they're not stupid either. And if you have a choice of thinking about an afterlife or thinking about a no life, uh, and somehow somebody <laughs> can convince you that the afterlife notion is remotely plausible, even though there isn't a sh- shred of evidence anywhere about it, notwithstanding that profound lack of evidence, people seem to think it's a worthwhile concept, if only because, and here's what's the important part, it helps them orient their current behavior. Mm. And so joining a a community of fellow believers uh, not only gives you a kind of salve for the pain of thinking about death, but it helps you behave in ways that uh, kind of have other psychological payoffs. Again, coming back to the brain, the act of conviviality itself produces feelings of uh, the cuddle juice, that sort of thing, produces a sense of, uh, of life as warm, as expansive, as kind of agreeable. And the sense of community is always desirable for most people. Mm. And, uh, you know, I, we talked earlier about my own position here. I'm very fond of, of Max Weber's description of himself. He wrote three of the most magisterial histories mm-hmm. of religion in the world, mm-hmm. of the three major religions, but he called himself religiously unmusical. He understood it. He didn't get it. Right. And I think that that there are many people that get it and don't care to understand it because that's not their job. Right. They hear the tune and they don't need to really understand the music behind it, the notes. They don't need to be able to uh, read music in order to know the tune. Well, that's a good way of putting it, and I think the that uh, what again to come back to the original formulation here. What what concerned uh, Michael McGuire and me was that uh, the idea of religion as a source of community or of explanation and so on had become so hot mm-hmm. for reasons which were. Uh, attractive in publishing terms and in dialectic terms and so on, but it just seemed to me that it was time to step back and say, wait a second, we've got this huge behavioral syndrome in our species. It doesn't come from the elbow. It doesn't come from the shoulder. Clearly, it comes from the brain. 
McGuire is an expert on brains, and mm -hmm. he understood serotonin well before others, uh, along with his colleagues. And uh, let's make use of that. So in a really uh, measurable way, your book is a rejoinder or a response to the new atheist. I mean, you're an atheist or a skeptic or whatever word you want to use, but uh, you're offering uh, what you might imagine to be a corrective to that line that says, Religion is bad, and if you're religious, you're dumb. I, I'm not offering a corrective, uh, a helping hand. Ah, if you're saying religion is dumb, Michael McGuire and I are saying, uh, well, maybe dumb, but sassy and happy neurophysiologically, and let's <laughs> examine why. Mm. And so I think that uh, the life of the skeptic, of the atheist, of the firebrand who thinks that any person who believes is some sort of weird, dangerous maniac, uh, first word is relax. If you can not live in a, in a sort of uh, Sabara and Orola, however you pronounce that, kind of community uh, like the Spaniards in 1492, if you can, as it were, choose your community, which we can't always do, uh, then don't see this as a, as a dire issue because in a curious way, if you happen to be opposed to religious people, much of their activity is wholly theoretical. It has to do with the nature of God. Now, when it gets to issues about abortion and uh, those kinds of things, which are not necessarily religious, they may right. as well be moral, just straight moral. Right. Uh, then, then you've got a different case. But again, I, I somehow felt that the argument had gotten out of hand and that we had to get back to a natural science of religion and make use of what we know is the principal instrument of religion, both coming and going, which is the brain. Mm. I'd like to let our listeners know that you can get a copy of God's Brain through our website, forgoodreason.org. Lionel, you mentioned maybe uh, offering a helping hand to the new atheists, not a corrective, but basically saying, relax, religion is natural, let's try to explain it, not you know, explain it away. But what about the harm that religion causes, or do you see that as being overplayed by the new atheists? I'm not only talking fundamentalism and terrorist bombers and that sort of stuff, but the harm in, you know, white bread American lives, you know, when they believe too much of the supernatural. Uh, here I agree with you that it gets to be very tricky uh, as a personal stance, how you deal with that. At the same time, I mean, let's assume that any jihadist is crazy, mm -hmm. and uh, people who live with that metric in their lives clearly uh, are exceptionally dangerous. And I have no particular recipe that would be helpful to anyone dealing with some uh, imam somewhere that wants to have death for the infidels for breakfast. Mm. That's a separate issue. I'm really talking, and it's a uh, limited group to address, people of goodwill, some literacy, who are interested in how and why human beings behave. It seems to me that if you want to change a system, it's essential that you understand it first. And if you want to have an impact on religious organizations, religious behavior, understand it first. Hmm. Don't just as it were, criticize it and say, you, you poor sap, you don't understand how stupid you really are to believe in the Holy Trinity. Well, you know, I come back and I've written about this before. Probably the most successful uh, religious holiday in the world is Christmas. And what is Christmas but a celebration of the fact that a woman who gets pregnant is needy, she needs help, she gets help from the community, the three wise men. And everybody celebrates the core mammalian experience, which is mother and child at their best, producing or reproducing. Now, what's so interesting in terms of the contemporary situation we face with male and female differences and deadbeat dads and the like is the brilliant stroke that because Mary is a virgin, 
Joseph is not a father, not the deadbeat dad. Mm. And the responsibility <laughs> for welfare goes to the community, and the community steps up. Right, leaving aside cheeky responses like, was God the deadbeat dad there? Or exactly, any of that all, stuff. all of that. Yeah. But it, as a story, it is universally understandable at some limbic level. Mm-hmm. I, I don't think anyone would sit down and have a kind of serious logical discussion of this. Right. But you can have a biological discussion of it. And that's why I think it's so interesting that we understand the the reasons for many of these rituals and observations and so on. Because very often you will find that they correspond to some very basic human needs, uh, uncertainties, perplexities, and uh, skills. So that's basically the big push of this book, God's Brain, that almost everything religion does for us is something, it's kind of a a loop, it's something both our brains do and our brains need done for our brains, right? So it provides all these social needs, meets those. It governs reproductive life, which is always turbulent. Well, you mentioned abortion a few minutes ago. Let's talk about sex and religion because religion not only governing the reproductive life, but it it enters into really every aspect of human sexuality. Most people think of only fundamentalists focusing on everyone's sex life, but you actually see religion of all stripes and all around the world and every culture getting entangled in sex. So the question is, why is that? Just because it's that basic? Um, Why does uh, widespread supernatural belief about life after death or God taking care of us always seem to actually come around to personal matters of sexuality? Because sex is so powerful, it's so attractive, so much fun. Men and women are wired for it practically until they die, certainly until they're 50 or 60. And uh, you have a a, a group of humans, uh, females, who uh, spend a great deal of time, energy, and change uh, on their appearance, and their, it's not just pride, but it is part of the whole reproductive game, mm. and it's uh, they know that. Yeah, it's mating rituals, all that. All that. And so it's a very important process, and uh, religious organizations try to intervene at every stage, birth, communion, bar mitzvah, marriage, and so on, death, finally. But the reason is, I think, because uh, they're too difficult, I think, to work out entirely on one's own. And the the dream of the sort of psychologically renaissance person who can figure out every ritual, every move in life, every obligation and every right, uh, th- that's very hard to do. It takes, it takes a huge amount of, of effort. It, Bertrand Russell was very unusual. And people like him are very unusual. Most people haven't got the time. They're running for a bus. Mm. Most people don't have what it takes to invent oneself, kind of make one's life a work of art. Instead, you need institutions to fit into, you're saying. It's it's easier, and that's – well. again, we have a chapter on, on primates. That's what primates do. If you're a self-willed, self-controlled primate, you're doomed. You can't make it alone. You've got to be in a group. And the stories we tell about how primates interact in a way that is almost like a religious service is, is to me, somewhat convincing, or actually very convincing, of the fact that they, too, understand the importance of communities. So just now, uh, and I don't want to get off track because I want to stay on religion or at least get back to religion, but right now it seemed like you were using the term community and the term religion interchangeably. Yes, uh, but not conceptually. It's just that they tend to go together uh, empirically. If you you look at an institutional structure of a community, very often it's the churches that have a role to play, Mm -hmm. more than garages, say, in in organized terms. Understood. I want to get back to sex, one of my favorite topics. You know, religion is really... Um, I know nothing more fascinating than to study religion, but sex is a close second, maybe. Um, Even liberal religions, even religions that you would think would not be interested in human sexuality, they seem to be all kind of worked up about 
human sexuality as well, but on the other side, kind of to oppose the puritanical or the fundamentalist take on human sexuality. So reproductive rights, the liberal churches are all activists in a pro-abortion sort of way. They're all pro-gay rights, not just kind of saying to each his own, but they're actually advocating for uh, a different take on this specific topic in human sexuality. So it's really across the board. It's not just a sliver of religion that's all wound up about human sexuality. It's all religion in a sense. Uh, yes, uh, but you you have also to ask yourself, what is the function of a church in affecting reproductive success? I'm talking here in terms of having good, healthy, viable, themselves reproductive offspring. There, just an interesting uh, case in point, there has been some talk of a male contraceptive mm -hmm. that uh, men can take and uh, they can, not the condom. But a chemical. A chemical. Yeah. And so they will, they will not be fertile. And it appears that so far there's been a lot of opposition to this from guess who? Women. Hmm. And why is that? Because one of the ways men and women get married and get together is people get pregnant. And there, hmm. my, my last book, The Decline of Males, mm -hmm. dealt extensively with the consequence of female-controlled conception or contraception so that males no longer knew who their children were because women could, and I believe should, uh, be able to decide themselves what their reproductive status shall be. But this meant that men lost what in biology we call paternity certainty in a rather sharp manner and could no longer really be sure uh, that the uh, child that their woman was bearing was necessarily theirs. Mm -hmm. And the consequence of that is that a lot of men simply escaped the game or left the game and became, uh, as I put it in my book, they became outlaws rather than in-laws. And so we now find a really new reproductive situation. For example, for the first time in England, there are more unmarried women than women. And in, in France, the, the, this kind of goes against the fundamentalist Christian notion in the States that unwed mothers lead to social ills. But in France, there are more unmarried mothers of children than there are married, uh, th you know, I'll have to dig up the exact statistic, but this kind of data is marshaled forth to argue against things like gay parenting or single mother parenting, you know, that you need one man, one woman, and France hasn't fallen apart. You're, you're just suggesting that the, the everything's changing, but uh, so how does religion enter into that? Well, re religion uh, essentially, I think, had been a way to discipline the males. Everyone said that you need religion to keep the girls pure so that they will be virgins on their wedding night. And in some places, as you know, the, the bed sheets would have to be mm -hmm. draped out over the parapet uh, and uh, there had to be a blood stain mm -hmm. signifying virginity. But the importance of the religious pattern is to keep the males in line. So have we lost something with religion not keeping the men in line? I wouldn't want to make a comment on that. It's it's above my pay grade, as it were. Uh, but I think that there, are, uh, if you talk to a lot of women uh, in big cities or small cities who are very well educated uh, because they knew they had to take care of themselves and ask them about their reproductive careers, they'll go on about their productive lives, fine. They work at Procter & Gamble, and they do this and that, and they could take trips and so on. Ask about their reproductive lives, and they turn one and say, well, I, I wish there was one good man. Well, it, it does, uh, Lionel, sound like you're drawing a direct line between the reduction of the impact of religion and this negative social consequence. It really... <laughs> Sounds no, like I'm, I'm actually what I'm what I am talking about is the introduction of technology in the form of the birth control pill. Ah, yeah. And the religions uh, were kind of taken aback by this. I don't think that, except for the Catholics, uh, none of the other religious groups had any strong opinion about it. Partly, I think, because they didn't fully appreciate the enormity <laughs> of what was going on. Mm. The Catholics had some sense. 
and that's why they forbade women to use contraception and right. advocated the rhythm method and so on, you know, haplessly. And they could still keep the men in line, They could, that's right, because uh, the shotgun was always there. Mm. And when Susie came home and said, you know, I've got good news for us, I'm pregnant, uh, George said, oh, well, well, how wonderful. Now when she <laughs> came home, he said, uh, she said, I've got good news, we're pregnant. He says, we? Mm. And until DNA testing comes along, which changes the rules right again, uh, uh, that was the case. And I think the the change in the world has been profound, and it hasn't had a great deal to do with religion, because I think that finally reproduction is is the primary driver of uh, human activity, and uh, religions have sought to control that as they will, for example, in fundamentalist Muslim communities. Uh, But the fact is that even when you look at the uh, women wearing uh, headscarves or veils or whatever, uh, most people think this is a sign of religious affiliation. It's really a sign to the men that I'm going to be a decent wife. Hmm because I'm, I'm, I'm part of the community, so you can trust me. And there are many, uh, I wouldn't say westernized, but let's say educated in the Western world, women in Muslim societies who still wear the burqas uh, and consider it kind of pro-woman to do so. It's, it, it's very mysterious to many of us from outside that culture, but it's quite understandable given uh, the fact that, that sex is such, such a volatile issue. I had a student uh, who did her doctorate with me at uh, Rutgers University. Uh, She was an Austrian English woman, very, very bright, who married an Iranian. And uh, they lived in the countryside. And she told me that uh, she studied mate selection in rural Iran, and she told me that uh, if if you're walking down the street in Iran and you're a guy and you happen to just hit a woman by mistake, you're, it's a crowded area and, and you touch her, it's suddenly a big matter for families because you violated her sanctity somehow. Mm-hmm. And it's very, very tension-provoking. However, when she was pregnant, Strange men would come up and pat her belly and say, "Wonderful, wonderful," because she was she was clearly already pregnant, and the issue of paternity uh, didn't arise. Interesting. Well, that's an extreme case, uh, but on the other hand, uh, it did happen, and it probably still happens. And that illustrates uh, that there are complex social factors going into this. It's not just the tyranny of religion making women wear burqas. Well, I, I would be very upset if uh, all people in my community were required to wear burqas. Uh, on the other hand, I can understand uh, that uh, in communities with uh, limited resources, very strict hierarchies of politics, uh, that this uh, may have developed. And the other thing that, that Paula, my student, told me was that in Iranian rural life, there's supposed to be a very puritanical social existence. Uh, but she said, go upstairs to the sleeping alcoves and you'll see the walls plastered with Playboy bunnies, all kinds of raunchy (laughs) material, because nice girls just want to have fun. Right, within the confines of nice society or something like that. That's right, that's right. So I I think, again, that the uh, idea of religion as a sort of portmanteau uh, damper of all fun and exuberance and sexuality may be right in many communities. uh, We talk in our book about James Joyce's portrait of an artist as a young man, and you see the strenuousness and, and difficulty of his movement from being a, a, a pious Catholic to becoming a, a, the kind of writer that he was. Mm. Uh, it, it, very painful. And most people don't go through that. They just uh, either treat the entire matter less seriously than Joyce did, or they accept it and they say, fine, this is, we have certain traffic rules, and uh, stop when you come to an octagonal sign. Professor, we were speaking earlier about replacing religion, if it could be done. Uh, Religion seems like it's here to stay. It's hardwired or it's a function of the brain. You know, that's your take. At the turn of last century, leading social thinkers, they all predicted the impending demise of religion. They talked about how society would continue to become secular. Supernatural religion would, would be replaced with a... Uh, in quotes, religion of humanity, yet supernatural religion persists. Um, I think that there is a growing skeptics movement, atheist movement, something like that. 
so my question is, what accounts for that growing even as religion's here to stay? One of the important principles of biology is variation. And skillful communities enhance variation. I've often thought, for example, that one of the reasons that societies like North Korea or East East Germany uh, were and are so boring is because they don't have freedom of communication. <laughs> and in a, in a kind of primate community or a small-scale human community, we need everybody. We can't afford to shut somebody up. You might have somebody who's who's uh, a diabetic, who's getting up early in the morning and saying, we've got to get some food today. Let's go hunting right now. Half the, half the community says, oh, I just want to turn over and go back to sleep. No, 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 says this uh, unusual figure, and they go out and they get something, or they don't. But basically my point is that trying to restrict the nature of communities, either as 1492 Spain or 2010 North Korea, or any other of these exceptionally rigid communities, uh, if you're going to do that, you might well lose out. And uh, when people are highly regimented, uh, they lose uh, fertility of imagination, a sense of nimbleness, a sense of experiment, and so on. And so I can be perfectly happy uh, seeing a skeptic's meeting on the fallacies of the Holy Trinity and a church called the Holy Trinity. I, that it <laughs> doesn't bother me. Uh, it doesn't bother me now. It used to when I was uh, younger and I, I had grown up in Montreal, which has more churches per capita uh, th- than almost anywhere else in North America, and also, incidentally, the highest ratio of rental as opposed to owned homes. <laughs> As an aside, yeah. That was a community uh, where religion was very, very important. And as a Jewish kid, I was always getting beat up because I had done this terrible thing to Jesus, which uh, escaped my notice. Uh, <laughs> uh, but it was it was tough. And so I've always been very suspicious of religious zealots and uh, uniform views on what you're supposed to think and what you're supposed to believe. At the same time, we now live in a in a world where people are constantly moving. Everyone's inside everyone else's skull with the Internet and cell phones and every which way. And I think we have to adapt to a new v- velocity of interaction with people not like uh, you and me or him and her. But that velocity of interaction, are you suggesting that at the same time the the non-religious will be growing even as religion will persist and will never go away? I I can't say. First of all, for groups to grow, they have to reproduce. And I don't know about the birth rates of Mm. the skeptic movement, for example. The secular left have a lower birth rate, say, than fundamentalist Christians. That's for darn sure. And and that's non-trivial. Yeah, I see. And, and uh, it's the same with Orthodox Jews who have seven or eight children. Mm-hmm. Or Mormons, etc. Exactly. And so one wants to look at numbers, uh, you know, how many divisions does the Pope have? Napoleon asked once. Uh, numbers are, are non-trivial. And in places uh, like India, Pakistan, where there are these religious divides, birth rates are are important. Mm -hmm. So I think that's one measure, and you're quite astute in being able to drag up that fact about uh, secular left and birth rates, uh, because that's very important. It might well be that if you're a, a very thoughtful individual on the secular left, you spend a lot of your time and energy concerned with uh, environmental issues overpopulation you don't have kids but therefore you're going to be um bred out of the race exactly and not that everybody has an irreplaceable brilliant gene that that it will be lost forever mm-hmm. but we're talking now about very large groups and the very large groups in the world currently the most uh influential and possibly dangerous are the religious ones mm. remember we used to fight over communism and capitalism was it better to own a store or to have a government controlled monopoly well who cares about that now and now you find people lining up on grounds of what's called Western 
uh, society, which is essentially Christian, I guess, Judeo-Christian, uh, or Islamic society, and 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 uh, in the middle you have Europe with uh, a measure of bafflement about its inability to deal with its own complexity, as we're currently seeing in Greece, mm. and uh, somehow. I'm not, uh, though I wrote a book on optimism, The Biology of Hope, which is why I was interested in what religion did. I, I'm not sufficiently optimistic about any set of arrangements to think that they are irrevocably uh, going to increase and improve. Mm. The opposite may well be true. Mm. Well, on that optimistic note, Professor, thank you for joining me for our discussion. Very much appreciated it. Well, I enjoyed it myself, and I, I wouldn't mind going on about it, but I know everyone has their limits, including <laughs> your audience. Uh, no, no, I I know, uh, I at least I think I know my audience. They'd be up for hours more, so we'll have you back on the show to be sure. Thank you. Thank you. And now, again this week, is The Honest Liar. Here's Jamie Ian Swiss. Hey, sports fans, what's the most deceptive American sport? Major League Baseball regards 1869 as the year baseball was officially born as a professional sport, and research shows that the transmission of secret signals across the baseball diamond began the very same year, an element of the game that is not only crucial to its workings and very nature, but that is therefore as old as the game itself. Inspired by semaphores, Morse code, and the use of military signaling in the Civil War, baseball signals are a complex craft, one that players, pitchers, catchers, hitters, fielders, not to mention managers, and a multitude of coaches must master in order to be successful. And yet it is an element of the game that is invisible to most casual fans. If most of what you know about baseball is summed up by three strikes and you're out, four balls and you walk, well, then baseball might just appear on the surface to be the world's slowest and least interesting sport. But, not unlike the movie Microcosmos, which revealed the hidden world of insect life that is invisible to most casual observers, the game of baseball is also dense, with secrets, deceptions, and strategies that shift and change with literally every single pitch of the ball. Indeed, probably a thousand such secret signals are communicated in a typical baseball game, not only among the defense, that is, from catcher to pitcher on each and every pitch, but on the offensive side as well, from the manager and coaches in the dugout, out to the coaches on the field posted near first and third base, and who in turn relay those signals to the hitter preparing to swing at the next pitch. This silent cacophony of signals without noise renders the game, for many fans like myself, a gripping and endlessly fascinating drama, as dense and duplicitous as a John le Carré spy novel. And indeed, it is the relaxed pace of the game of baseball that enables this subterranean channel to even exist, since a faster game would not permit the elaborate coded sequences used to communicate countless strategic decisions that managers communicate to players, including the steal, double steals, the hit and run, directing hitters when to take a pitch, such as on a 3-0 and count, or when to lay down the bunt, or that glory of the game made famous by Jackie Robinson, stealing home. And like any good code... These signals must be difficult to crack in order to prevent the opposing team from secretly stealing your signs and using that information to their advantage. In fact, stealing signs is also as old as the game itself, since there were references to a team being caught stealing signs in the early 1870s, a practice that continues to this very day. According to a 2001 article in the Wall Street Journal, in the legendary 1951 playoff game between the New York Giants and the Brooklyn Dodgers, the Giants were allegedly stealing signs with a telescope. So in the game that eventually ended with Bobby Thompson's legendary shot heard round the world home run, Thompson might just have known what was coming. Now the code itself, a sequence of gestures, can render a coach appearing as if he has been beset by a cloud of mosquitoes or a sudden case of indigestion, tapping and touching his chin, chest, nose, ears, hat, or belt buckle in a dizzyingly rapid sequence. And yet, even when all that is done, it might just be a single sign, the first or the last gesture, for example, that actually communicates the critical information. Of course, if the team that is hitting has a runner on second base, then the other team must be prepared to change their signs so as to prevent the runner from stealing them and signaling the next pitch's location to the hitter. How does he do that? 
Well, one possibility is that as the runner leans forward, preparing to run, he touches a knee with one of his hands. Left hand means one side of the plate. Right hand means the other. And now his teammate, the batter, is ready for the location of the next pitch, a potentially devastating advantage. But what about the rules, you ask? Well, there actually is no rule against stealing signs because signaling is such a fundamental element of the game. However, in recent years, management has indicated that they will frown on the use of electronic or mechanical equipment beyond the use of the human eye and hand. And thus the battle between signs and sign stealers continues evermore. Now, as the honest liar, I am interested in the countless ways that deception enters our daily lives. But perhaps in fairness, I should acknowledge a differentiation between deception and subterfuge. Most of signaling perhaps falls more in the category of subterfuge, whereas outright deception would be, for example, when the pitcher tries to keep the runners guessing by faking a throw toward first base, then fakes another throw toward third, or in the rare but lovely case of a fielder faking a throw and hiding the ball for a moment from the runner in order to induce a runner to expose himself to a tag or a throw on the base path. So what American sport is most laden with deception? Well, this fan would suggest that it's probably baseball, not because of the crudely concealed use of steroids, a disgraceful but fortunately passing phase in the great game's history, but rather thanks to the beautiful coded deceptions that flash across the diamond before every pitch, invisible to all but the combatants and their fascinated fans. Could it be that this very element of elegant deception is what really makes baseball America's pastime? This is Jamie Ian Swiss, and I am the Honest Liar. Let's go Yankees! Thank you for listening to this episode of For Good Reason. To get involved with an online conversation about this episode, join our discussion at forgoodreason.org. Views expressed on For Good Reason aren't necessarily the views of the James Randi Educational Foundation, Questions and comments on today's show can be sent to info at forgoodreason.org. For Good Reason is produced by Thomas Donnelly and recorded from St. Louis, Missouri. Our music is composed for us by Emmy Award-nominated Gary Stockdale. Contributors to today's show included Jamie Ian Swiss and Christina Stevens. I'm your host, DJ Grothy. Mm-hmm.